would you like to comment on that? I mean, could there have been another option for our Liberian change or the so-called African perspective? Especially when I look at the issue that in 1982, there was scheduled an election, which meant within about three years. And already the two-party system, confronted with the global issue of um, respect for human rights, the United Nations, and all the other pressures, the battle against the communist forces, had sort of made, and then especially the death of Todman himself, had reached us to a point where it seemed that automatically that process of change could have come if it had been properly balanced and channeled with the right ideology and vision of leadership. So could you please give us a little discussion on that possibility or prospects? I follow what you say. You see, the methodology used in terms of violence <clears throat> who was not brought about by those who were agitating for change. I'm glad you mentioned that an election was scheduled for 1982. So I go back and say, and I quote Albert Port, who is an authority on this, since we're dealing with a hypothetical situation. So what happens if the government of Talbot had listened to Albert Port? What happened is the police had not opened fire on April 14, 1979. What happened if the Talbot government had only said, let them demonstrate, let them go ahead. They're not your boys. They'll give them some, if I give them the police ban, let them march to the streets of Morocco. <laughs> so what would have happened? I ask you. Those who were agitating, I made it quite plain that we had analyzed the situation. We were focusing on an election of 1982. And we had our forces in place. We knew that, and we were being very practical politicians. The leader of our movement, Dr. Tipute, was from the Southeast, had grown up in Morovia. On the other side, Dr. Reverend Tyre was from Nimba County. This was an amalgamation of the Cry and the Mendemel group with a scattering of people from Morovia who believe in our politics, who felt there was a need for change. Like the young men and women who had gone to the Bikiana Congress of the Tui Party and had demanded that certain changes be made within the structure of the Tui Party to reflect the ethnic balance of this group. So what would have happened if the Tui party had listened to Albert Port and refused to have a confrontation to show that he was in power. What would have happened? It's possible that there wouldn't have been a violent change. It is possible that Mr. Talbot would have retired in 1982 after presiding over in elections. And let me be bold to say, it would have been possible that Moja would have won a free and open election and the process of social transformation would have continued and there wouldn't have been any bloodshed. So you see, historical hypotheses can be, can be very fluid, they are volatile. What are we talking about here? We are not talking about young men and women who consciously say we need violence. Although some of us had read Hegel, we understood lordship and bondage. We understood, we understood the classics we had read. The force of violence in history by Franz Fanon, Bismarck, the politics of iron and steel, we had read all of that. But the Liberian society was not developed to that level. I think what sparked, what sparked this gamble for the winning of support was the fact that Pal was taking advantage of the possibility of mobilizing people around the rice demonstration. Moja was on his way to register a political party to begin to agitate for 1982. I think with the reality in a society, the students at the University of Liberia demanding changes at Cottonton, students asking to be heard, I think the panic came from within the two party. Men who had not been used to this kind of confrontation, which was moderate, moderate, but any stretch of the imagination. People acting within the confines of the constitution. No group had arms. Paul did not. When they transformed into PPP, they had no arms. Moja had no arms. I sit here, I can sit categorically. So, what happened? Who introduced the question of armed violence into Liberian politics? 
Was it two way party? Was it two way party? Yeah. <laughs> and after they introduced the armed violence, they miscalculated. For the soldiers they were depending on, since, since realized that with the guns, they could go one step further. They could take power. Why they brought us in? Because they were looking for legitimacy. We are the people agitating for democratic transformation. We were the people on the line talking about opening up the democratic space. Allow the people the right to choose the leaders. My movement, Moja, had even gone to the extent of putting forward Barrow Sawyer as a mayor, a mayor or candidate. We wanted to test the system to see whether they had in place the mechanism for free and fair elections. Of course, they aborted the elections. So, yes, it would have been good. It would have been good if, of course, we did not have the violent response. If we had leadership material that realized that in dealing with aggrieved people, you can use water cannons. You can use pepper spray. You don't have to use life ammunition. When you put the people's children in the mortuary and they see the dead bodies of the children, they only pray to God that your time will come. <laughs> That's all they can do. So I throw, I throw the question back to the landed commissioner. Do you think the methodology of the two-way party moving towards election, the transformation of the regional and international system, do you think, do you think that if the leadership had exercised the tolerance, the patience and the understanding, it could not have handled the demonstration and save us from the tragedy that we experience? If this was the enlightened party, if this was a party of men who were conscious of their responsibility to society, why they show of force? Why they show of force? What did you want to demonstrate? What did you want to demonstrate? The various wars you fought in this country were different wars. You were successful, yes, but this was a different time in history. So what were you trying to show? It was their desire to show that they could control power, and let me say this, I remember very well, after the Rice Riot, there was this talk again, Mr. Talbot, by certain elements of the oligarchy of the two way party, that he was weak, he was not decisive enough. And the son of one of such men said to Dr. Zamba Liberty, my father says Talbot is weak. What we need to do is to carry out a massacre or a few of these rubble rousers, noise makers, and we can hold this thing for our children for the next 50 years. So I'm convinced that they were trying to prove a point. That this agitation for them was not confrontational. It was annoying because of the arrogance. So they would teach these upstarts a lesson. They would teach these jigger pleas a lesson. Sons and daughters of peasants, how dare you request to have a share in power in the republic? This was the mentality. And so go out there, shoot them, bury them. They're poor people's children. They only have money to go to funeral homes. Who's going to bother with them? So you came out and you kill people. Once you address the political issue by violence, you were yourself in the eye of the storm. And that came a year later. How do you blame us for that? How do you blame those who are agitating for the rights of the people to vote? We didn't bring the soldiers on the streets. We didn't train the soldiers. You did. You did. And that is why a leadership must be wise. A leadership is leadership is not by dressing, but only by dressing in white, waving, waving a, a stick in your hands. That's not leadership. It's in understanding the tempo of the society, where your people are going, what they believe in. And I am convinced, beyond all reasonable doubt, beyond all reasonable doubt, and I say this here with all sincerity, on the morning of April 14, 1979, if Mr. Talbot had said to Mr. Albert Post, I will accompany you to these people. These are children. 
These are little boys. What do they understand? I will accompany you and I will discuss with them. And what I will do, they say they can bring rice for so and so price, I will give them $10,000. Let's bring rice, let's see. Oh, you want to demonstrate? Go ahead. Go ahead. But if your supporters behave unruly, you are going to be irresponsible. That would have been it. It would have been it. And brother said, he said, yeah, well, probably they shall call us and giving us jobs. No Moja were not after jobs. We wanted power to transform the society. That's why we're fighting for the elections. So I'm saying here, yeah, it would have been a good thing for, us to, for all of us to go to our churches, to our mosques, to our schools, to our homes. And nobody gets on the streets. And there will be peace. Since history does not give people the luxury of deciding which action to take. If you blunder in history, sometimes you pay dearly for your blunder. And this was happening to the two-way party. Now if you ask me, do you regret the two-way party falling from power? Is there a hungry man who ever regrets the opening of a store for free food? <laughs> Politically, 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 we'll have to do more study of the two we party. More study of the two we party. So, to the Honorable Commissioner, I say, I understand your argument about methodology. I would have rather the two we party had wiser men, or the two we party had listened to the young people at the Buchanan Congress, had carried out the necessary changes has embraced the people of this country. And if Mr. Talbot was bold and decisive enough, he would have thrown his lot with the people and not be dragged into the depths of conservatism by the old guys who wanted no change, who were not in favor of change. So if you like, Mr. Talbot was a sacrificial lamb. In history, in history, we do not recognize good intentions. Practical deals are what matter, not good intentions. You can be Jesus Christ. That's uh, it's not for nothing he hasn't come back after 2,000 years. Good intentions are one thing. Practical reality is another. Mr. Talbot, for some people who says, Mr. Talbot was a good man. He had good ideas, good intentions. Poor Mr. Talbot. After Tuckman, history did not give you that luxury. They did not give you that luxury of keep on believing in good intentions. The people wanted transformation. If you were not about to accommodate the wishes, Mr. Talbot, you had to be a sacrificial victim, your own people. And the people will show no sympathy. And they show no sympathy. Please. Please. For the young men and women who are part of the two-way party, I think you have to do a serious introspection of the shortcomings that brought us to where we are today. We wanted elections. We are Democrats. Even if we are revolutionary Democrats. Like those you believe in in America, the founding fathers. We are Democrats. We wanted elections. And I said to you, yeah, we were convinced that election in 82, we could have won such elections. But it was you, it was you, who thought you could gamble with violence. You gamble. And you know what happened to gamblers? Sometimes they win, sometimes they lose. <laughs> Serious, you lost. You lost. And that explains our tragedy. Thank you. In summary, I understand that what you're telling me is that we regrettably lacked righteous leaders at that transitional point. 
because just as you said, uh, why didn't Talbot or the Tui party make a change? They couldn't have. They were filled with the inertia of their history of 100 years of selfish rule. So the change had to come from those who were making the initiative to change. They should have had the wisdom to know better. As like you said, Mr. Mark Matthews maybe didn't have that and he was naive in just trying to approach a system with people who thought, he, where he thought they would have just, you know, naturally given up. But that was a naive approach. But others like yourself and others who have that understanding of the historical struggle somehow would have felt there should be an understanding and a clearer plan. Because if somebody else even had offered the sacrifice of Talbot, let's say he became a sacrificial lamb, but somebody else offered that sacrifice, the transition into a peaceful Liberia would have been smooth if it had not been for the fact that you take someone from a difficult environment full of resentment and, and, and concern about being not given any hope in life and you put that person in the position of power and seat, it's not easy. So that was just my, my yeah. thought of reflection when I asked that question. But, but, but uh, Commissioner, let me, let me say something about that. And it's very interesting. We, know, we must not put on the blinkers of policemen. It was not told but he was symbolic of a system. He represented an oligarchy. And what I've been trying to say to you and others is that you say me, myself, Oboima Pambule. This was a man who was demonized. There was not a time when he was, I was even called or any of my people to say, can we discuss about the future of Liberia? We were hounded. Security people in the classroom, not to listen to our lectures, but to hear information. Now, if these people were suffering from historical inertia, they couldn't move, then probably we should ask ourselves the question, if they couldn't move, then what gave them? What gave them the audacity to feel that those who were on the street agitating could be silenced, could be silenced with guns and bayonets? It's a simple question. The people were paralyzed. So what gave them that girl? Well, I mean, what boldness? You can say one thing, you don't want to say it. They were not naive, they were probably politically stupid, or they were so arrogant, so arrogant, that they felt that after a hundred years of putting down protests, they were capable of doing it. And let me say this, there were people in a society who kept preaching, I don't agree, don't even look at the political actors. The man who was right here, Reverend Tim Reeves, I listened to his sermon every Sunday from the time I came home in 78. This noble man using his religion was talking against the injustice in the society. All the religious leaders all over, all over, were preaching, listening to the people. You, Mr. Tobo, you are a religious man yourself. You know your Bible. It's like the story I heard of a man who was deeply religious. He went swimming. Always worship God. This man went swimming. And he had a cramp. He was drowning. And then a the man came with a speedboat. Say, don't get on the speedboat. Get on the speedboat. He said, no, no, no. I believe in my God. You know, Jesus walk on water. I will get out of this place. You go. He's struggling in the water after five minutes, the helicopter, they threw down the ladder. Get on. He said, no, 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 go. I believe in my righteous God and things will be all right. When he looked, a very strong man came out swimming. Swimming. He said, hold on to me. He said, I don't want you. My Lord will protect me. So the man got, the man drowned and he went to heaven. He said, God, you know, I worship you all the time. I pray. I go to church. I pay my arms. I was drowning. I call on you. You never rescue me. The Lord said, I sent a boat. You drove it away. I sent a helicopter. You drove that away. I sent a strong man. Don't you understand that I have those who have themselves? Here was Mr. Talbot, a graduate of Cottington, I think, an educated man. 
in relationship with Ahmed Secretary of Guinea. He was the man who was traveling around Africa, who understood what was happening in Africa. Because his government, like Topman, provided passports to African freedom fighters, like Mandela and others. He was a man who understood the world. He had young technocrats around him. Brilliant men. On the other side, religious leaders. Saying that we are listening to the cries of the people. On one side, these so-called people you're called, they call noisemakers. Agitating. And you are telling me that these people did not understand what was happening in society? No, I think they understood. They understood. But you know, there's a problem with arrogance. Arrogance makes you feel superhuman. It makes you feel that you know everything. And you know what they say. Pride goes before a fall. Pride goes before a fall. They had the opportunity. Go, young people, young people, go and read the resolution from the Basa Cong Congress or the Tui Party. See what the youthful members of the Tui Party stipulated in that document. Why did they not listen? Let me tell you a simple story. We were, monitor we were monitoring very keenly the Buchanan Congress. We said the Tui Party can pull a fast one on us. They can come out with something that will take the raw from on us. All they had to do was to make Jackson do Secretary General. Take Edward Cassidy, gave him a major position. Take James Bagwe and all these people, put them in there. And say to the people, we have included the people's children. You cannot be on the outside and say to us, we are a little clique. We waited. We waited. And then they came with the announcement. Secretary General, Mr. X, Monrovia, Monserrado County. Treasurer, Mr. X, Monserrado County. This person, Monserrado County. We look at each other. These people have just dug their own grave. They can't win no elections. <laughs> so, it was not us. We were opposition. We were opposition. We could not say to Mr. Talbot, do these things because they won't listen, they won't listen to us. Some of the smartest young men from the University of Liberia, very smart men, they were called to the mansion. And one of the two party members looked at these young dynamic boys. He said, you are questioning us? Who are you? Then you over there, who's your father? The poor boy called some name, somebody from Lofa. He said, look at this irresponsible Jiga flea. <laughs> you are the people who are demanding. This was the attitude. And we hope and pray that no leader or no collection of leaders will emerge in this country with such arrogance. We hope and pray. <laughs> Thank you. Well, unless we separate from Satan, that may not happen. But uh, anyway, the next question. Why do you think that the Liberian people gave power to Taylor during the time of the election, knowing his track record of what he was like? As compared to, for example, yourself who ran during that time and others. What's your thinking on that? First, let me deal with Satan. <laughs> you see, <laughs> man creates man creates the devil in his image, and nobody has seen Satan. But we believe in the heart, our hearts of hearts, that human being can change. Nobody is born evil or wicked. Society, society conditions people. To go certain ways. To go certain ways. I always tell young people. I've read a bit about the Cuban Revolution. And before the revolution of 1959, American mobsters, uh, mafioso, gamblers used to go to Havana to look for little eight, nine year old Spanish girls. And you had all these prostitutes on the streets of Havana. That was the playground of the rich and powerful to go to Cuba. 
After the revolution, all these girls were put into homes. They were trained to be nurses and overseers of daycare centers. Some of them had children who were sent to school and became medical doctors. This tiny island in the Caribbean exports doctors and health workers to many countries in Africa. Man is not born bad, he's not born evil. Society must be looked at critically.